uh, em and I, uh, Emily and I have talked a number of times about membership and you know it's not, I'm not ready I'm not ready and and then she was ready and I, I guess she was ready much earlier and she said something to me and I guess I didn't hear her uh, I have tinnitus in my ears um, and so when I approached her again, she was like, yeah, I already, I already said I wanted to be. And I'm like, oh, I, I didn't hear that. Um, so so th this, is, this is on my ear, my tinnitus. So, uh, But no, praise God. And we'll vote uh, to, for membership. Um, so, all right. Well, let's open with a word of prayer. Our Lord and our God, we thank you so much, Father, for... For the testimony we heard, Lord, and uh, and that it, you are the answer to all of our questions, uh, and your word is the only source of truth. Uh, Father, I just thank you um, for that testimony, and I, Lord, I thank you for each of our testimonies that we carry with us of how you changed us, how you made us into, a, into an image of your son, slowly but surely, with each trial we go through, Lord, you're chipping away more of who we are to reveal more of him in our lives. Uh, Lord, don't let us rush through our trials, um, but let us remember that we're, we should learn in, from them and my, our faith in, grows in from them. In my them. testimony, I would like um, to... Heavenly Father, I just thank you uh, and praise you, Lord, for... Um, Father, just for, for, for your salvation and the gift that you give each one of us, we thank you and praise you in your name. Amen. So last week we started to look at Romans 12. Um, and on the schedule I give uh, the song leaders so that they can pick songs following that theme. Um, I said, oh, I'll get through eight verses. <laughs> And I got through two. Um, so there's so much here. Last week we saw that we are to be living sacrifices. And sacrifices are forever. They are not temporary or limited in their time. Sacrifices should not expect to be given a retirement plan here on earth. Yes, God may put them in different fields to plant and reap in. But we are to run the Christian race to the finish line, which for a Christian is the grave. Anyone who believes that they have done enough for God is sadly ignorant about what the Bible says. Um, in our men's study, we were talking about Caleb and how at 80 years of age, he comes up to Moses and says, or Joshua and says, I'm ready to take my mountain, uh, the, the land that God promised me. And he went and did it. Um, Moses had settled into living a nice, quiet shepherd's life for 40 years. That's what he did. At age 80, boom, God calls him into service. And he leads 2 million Hebrew slaves. Sarah, 90 years old, and she is told, you're going to have a baby, a son, at age 90. And I'm told that um, having a child is somewhat, well, an adventure, or painful, depending on how you look at it. Uh, so I would imagine it's worse at age 90. Um, so anyone who really believes that God can only use special people at that age has a God who's too little, and they need to reevaluate what they say they believe. Something that we heard Emily say a couple times, that she kept reevaluating. So today I got good news and I got bad news for those who like to look at the clock while I speak. The good news is the actual sermon is going to be very short today. The bad news is the introduction is going to be longer. So, so let's begin uh, with an, the introduction of what God did, has done for us. Almighty God gave his only son to pay for the price of our sins. Sins that everyone here is guilty of. So everyone here has a hand in the death of his son. And in 1 Corinthians 6.20 it says, For God brought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. And having paid that high price to, 
free us from the slavery, as Romans 6, 15 to 18 says. Oh, if you're in Romans 12, going over to Romans 6 is a, a just a little leap. Go over to Romans 6. And the rule is, if it's three verses or more, we'll turn to it. Um, but Romans 6, verses 15 to 18. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean that we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you've become a slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once we were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery of sin and have become slaves to righteous living. And just in case you missed it, in Romans 6.22, just a couple of verses later, he says, Now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. And because of the price God paid to free us from the bondage, the life and death of his son, it's only reasonable service for us to live those purchased lives to bring glory and honor to God in everything we do. And if you, leave, don't, if you disagree with that, you might as well leave now. There's nothing here for you. I think of when God chose Saul, who later was renamed Paul to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And please, remember what we say, oh yeah, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Like, like, flippantly almost. But remember, Paul in Corinthians and in uh, Philippians gives his, his lineage. He was raised a Jew's Jew, a Pharisee to boot. Which means that had God not changed Paul, this type of position the apostle to the Gentiles would have been, he would have considered it as an insult. But God changed his heart. And while Paul still had an amazing love for the Jewish people, he took his responsibility to the Gentiles very seriously. He didn't turn around to God and say, you, you've got to be confused, God. I'm the best person to send to not, I am not the best person to send to those people, those mongrels, those dogs, as the Jewish people referred to Gentiles. He did not explain to God how much better it would be for him to teach the Jews, because he was a Pharisee. He could teach the Jews so much. He didn't say, God, you just have to understand, I'm better equipped to do, serve God in the way that I tell you to. No, that would be like telling God what is right and wrong or arguing with God about this is the way he should be doing things. Something that should never happen or never come across our mouths. But Paul didn't do that because Paul was no longer the man he had been. Not because of something he had done, but because of what God had done. He changed Paul. And it was evident in this man's life, just as it is in every man's life or woman's life, who really becomes born again. Remember, Paul, after he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he didn't wait around and say, well, i got to go to seminary now. Now, oh, i got to go do this. No, but in Acts 9, 20 to 22, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is indeed the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, they asked? And didn't he come here to arrest more and take them in chains to the leading priests? Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Paul, upon salvation, does a 180-degree turn in his belief and immediately starts preaching the gospel. And before you say, but, you know, then there were the three years in Arabia. Arabia in New Testament times could mean two, one of two places. Saudi, what we know as Saudi Arabia 
But the other one, which actually makes more sense when you look at Galatians 1, is the desert areas, the desert areas full of Gentiles surrounding Damascus. So that makes more sense. And yes, Jesus did have an encounter with Paul and did train Paul, as we saw it when we observed the Lord's table. Paul said, as the Lord gave to me. So, so when we are saved, radical change happens. Being born again is supposed to be the start of that radical change. It's not merely saying a prayer of confession or baptism. It's not being a good person. We see in the Bible people like Saul who go from being enemies of God to being adopted into his family. And a change is so radical and it is immediate. Several weeks ago, we watched The Cross and the Switchblade, a movie about that, how that truly happens. How God used a man from Podunk, Pennsylvania, David Wilkinson, to witness to Nicky Cruz, the leader of the, one of the most feared street gangs in New York City. David didn't use a carrot, didn't say, well, Nicky, if you become a Christian, everything's going to go your way. Or just say the prayer and I'll be out of here. No, he demonstrated the love of God. In the op one of the opening scenes, he was on the streets of New York. And these kids, you know, one kid kept mentioning his shoes. And Wilkinson looked at his shoe feet, and his shoes were all ripped up and torn. He took his shoes off and walked around New York City bare, like with socking feet. You see, he demonstrated that love of God. In the end, Nicky was saved, and he did 180 degrees. And he, he got up in front of his men. And basically, you followed me all this time, now follow me here. And Nicky Cruz, as far as I know, never relented. He set uh, ministries throughout the cities, uh, just as Wilkerson did. And before you say, well, change like that doesn't happen all the time at once, why not? It's a good question. Why not? Let me ask, when, were people drawn to becoming Christians in the early church because the apostles were very good salesmen? Or did the people see a radical difference between them and the other followers of Christ and the religions of that time? And another question was, did the radical change occur because of something the apostles observed? Or was it something they did? Was it a secret that they learned? No, the change did not occur because of something they had been taught. Remember, the apostles were with Jesus for three years. Yet, while they said a lot of the right words, they abandoned Jesus um, when all seemed hopeless. They seemingly didn't remember anything he said, even though the Bible says clearly that he repeatedly told them. And after he rose again, the angel said to the, the women, didn't Jesus say this is going to happen? And even when they tried to do it on their own, remember Peter tried to defend Jesus with his sword, and Jesus stopped them. And when Jesus did that, the disciples fled. And even hearing reports of the angels telling them that Jesus had risen from the dead, they still didn't believe. They met behind locked doors because they were afraid of the authorities. And even when Jesus appeared to them in that upper room, they saw, they touched him, they watched him eat, and he spent 40 days with them. We read at the, at near the end in uh, Matthew 28, Verses 16 and 17. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Even after seeing the risen Lord, even after spending time with him, some doubted. It's safe to say that at this point, they were not truly born again. They, they heard the words, 
They knew what Jesus was saying. They watched him, demonstrated. In fact, Jesus' last words to them in Acts 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Until that time, they were to stay, because they had no power. Flip over to Acts, if you're in Romans 1 book, Acts uh, 2. Acts 2. And we'll look at the first four verses. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongue, other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And dropping down to verse 11, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, said, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? You see, it was only when the Holy Spirit truly came upon, that things began to change. Amazing things that were evident to the Jews in Jerusalem. The apostles were no longer simple men from Galilee. They were now men with a mission for their Lord. They were changed. They were changed from the inside out. They were truly born again because of who was in them. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20, it says... Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God brought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. This is not something that takes a long time. Becoming born again is not a gradual slope. It happens instantly. Sanctification takes a longer time. But not as long as I think sometimes people want it to be. Some people have attempted, uh, uh, it goes back to Charles Finney back in the 1840s, who tried to replace the the Holy Spirit with something of man. He's the first one that started to do the mass revivals. Have people come forward, say the prayer, and substitute the things of man for what really real, real rebirth happens. Substitute that goody feeling of, I've said a prayer to the Holy Spirit coming into a person's heart. And I'm not saying that it always happens, but I'm saying it's too easy to come forward. It's a lot harder to be a living sacrifice. The Spirit of God inside a believer changes one's heart. Suddenly, sins that were pleasurable are not so anymore. Values no longer align to what we said they were. Our focus is no longer on this life and what it has to offer, but what's waiting for us at the end of the finish. Our desire is to spread the gospel to others, planting, watering seeds of the gospel everywhere we go. Suddenly, we hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's one of the Beatitudes. And there's only one thing that's truly righteous, and that's God himself. So we hunger and thirst for him through prayer and studying his word. The Bible no longer is just a book you pick up and read. It's the very word of God for us. And that is what we desire and thirst to know. And as we hunger and thirst after righteousness, the Holy Spirit starts to work inside of us. Remember, Jesus said one of the things about the Holy Spirit was in John 14, 26, But when his Father sends the Advocate, Holy Spirit, as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Remember, they they denied him. They, They ran away. They didn't listen. But all of a sudden, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, everything changes. So as we study God's Word and seek Him with our whole hearts, We not only change in our values, 
But a bigger change happens. Now, many of us, myself included, may not be looked at as the sharpest knives in life's drawers. And that's okay. But that doesn't exempt us from the Lord's service. Remember, you were brought with a price. You're not your own. So when God commands you to go out into all creation and proclaim the gospel as he does in Mark, he doesn't limit it to those who are smart people with quick minds who can argue both everywhere he goes. Uh, my friend Chris has shared at Bibles and Burgers and at the men's study, a guy he knew was probably one of the most intellectually smartest men he has ever met. And my friend Chris is a very smart man. Chris said, oh, I'm going to share the gospel with him. This will be so great because if, he's, if he gets saved, then, you know, what, a, what an asset for the kingdom. Well, it turns out when he started to share the gospel, the guy said, I, I've read the Bible cover to cover multiple times. He could speak to Chris about Christian beliefs and values. He studied it. He didn't accept it. Intellect can't save you. You can't do it. And so Chris was just really disappointed. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are more than what we were before. Remember when Peter and, and John healed that man who was born lame for, since his birth? And they were brought before the Sanhedrin. And a council of the very smartest Jewish religious leaders were there. And these men recognized something about John and Peter. In Acts 4.13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So if the apostles were simple, uneducated common men, we should be proud of that feature. That's us. But they shared the gospel with boldness regardless of who they were arguing against. Likewise, we have no excuse. In fact, that's how God often works. In 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 25 to 27, that he picks the foolish things of this world to demonstrate his power. Verse 25 says, This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. That means you were common, uneducated. He said, instead, God chose things that this world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that were, are powerless to shame those who think they are powerful. You think, see, it's the fact that you and I are common that God uses to demonstrate his power through us. And he's not talking about young people full of energy. He's talking about spirit-filled people. People who have become new creations, like the disciples at Pentecost, radically altered. The Bible describes it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new has begun. And I like the ESV much better. Uh, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. We are new creations when we become saved. We're new. Yeah, we may be, have old or, how did uh, Misty describe it? We may have seasoned bodies, but we're new creations. And it's a fulfillment of prophecy in Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. God said, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you the heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules." This wasn't just some fancy talking. It's not a metaphor. He's talking literally. 
If you do not have the Spirit of God inside of you today, you are not born again, you are not saved. When people are born again, you are new. Not just people who have been taught to act a certain way or say the right words. There's a lot of people who speak Christianese, but it doesn't save them. And people who generally do that hold on to their previous values. The Spirit opens our eyes to the facts that we are at war today, but not with the people or events that we see going around us. In Ephesians 6, verses 12 to 13, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. A real Christian's eyes are open to recognize that the battle is not about the, the people on the other side of the political aisle, whatever side that is, or unbelievers and nations who are attacking and persecuting Christians, or the media that con consistently mocks our belief, their faith is not in this country or in any country on this earth, because frankly, this isn't our home. When you are born again, this stops being your home. In Philippians 3, verses 20 to 21, the Bible says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Christians realize all those things of the world are just traps and snares of the enemy. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 2, that our minds should not be set on the things that we see or on the people that are against us, but we set our minds on things that are above, not on the things of the earth. You want to experience real peace? Substitute your time you spend uh, watching the news or watching TV with real Bible study and real prayer. And when we do share the gospel, the worst thing we can do is depend on ourselves. Have a formula. Ah, that's just not the way we share the gospel. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. We are not to use our own earthly weapons like Peter's sore or try to argue people into heaven. It doesn't work. You can't do it. And yes, you might get someone to say a prayer, but you lose a soul because they don't change. Instead, we use the weapons of God to bring people the gospel, we use more than the words of the gospel. You live the gospel before them. If you tell people you're a Christian that they need to be born again, yet you sound like a holified version of a political party activist, or if you value the same things that they value and pursue with their lives, why on earth do you think they'd believe you that they need Jesus? Or that just by saying a prayer, everything's going to be better? No! No! We are to be changed into a living sacrifice, living and holy, one that's acceptable to God. Now, I, I know this is a long on-ramp to an introduction, but I needed one of the things Paul will speak against is the sin of pride and arrogance. When people start to look at themselves as more than what they are in Christ, and they start to say things like, I'm a child of God, and that means something. It does, but it's not something you should be proud of. And from the position of authority, Paul's going to give us a warning. Don't think better of yourselves than you really are. And in the context, Paul is saying, as God changes the way you think, and you learn and desire what is his perfect and good will for you, don't let it go to your head. So that was the introduction. Let's turn to Romans 12. Romans 12. And we'll take a running start and do the first four verses. The first three verses. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you 
to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Again, as we saw last week, the two Greek words there mean reasonable service. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know what God's will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think better than you, of yourselves than you truly are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves and measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given us. Remember, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. God told Ananias this in Acts 9.15. He says, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings as well as to the people of Israel. And now Paul is saying in this passage today, by the privilege and authority given to him by God, he calls us to do a self-examination. The tense of the verb means that's an ongoing self-examination. It's not like you do it once and say, oh, I got some changes, and then leave it at that. Just as Jesus said, taking up your cross daily and following him was an ongoing thing, likewise, an honest self-examination of our lives is something we do all the time by comparing ourselves to the faith that God has given us. So we need to honestly evaluate ourselves and our walk. And no, our evaluation is not based on how we compare to so-and-so over there, or how much we know, or what our position we hold in our church, or uh, what's on the news, uh, up on the news that we are, because we watch it all the time. Self-evaluations are hard. Uh, when I started to work uh, uh, in the county, my manager always did my evaluation. Once a year, he, he would grade what, you know, how I did, where I can improve, where I, 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 I need to improve. Um, but when I became a manager, I expected the same thing. They said, no, you evaluate yourself. What? And they said, well, you evaluate yourself, and then you, you say what your strengths are, you say what your weaknesses are, and, and what your goals are, and what your plans are. And I said, but that doesn't make any sense, because I have a blind spot to a lot of things about myself. Oh, no, you have to do it. So every year, it was, it was a, one thing I really hated doing every year was, well, yeah, uh, my own evaluations. I didn't mind doing my, my, the people who worked for me evaluations because they would see where I saw their positives and negatives, and, and they would grow from them. But when I did it myself, on myself, you know, it doesn't work. You don't grow from those kinds of things. So, oh, our... Our, our walk, we evaluate based on the faith that God has given us. And remember, we are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And this is not our own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. We must live and serve by grace through faith type of lives. Our faith begins when we hear the good news of the gospel, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing, that is, hearing the good news about Christ. But it is only through God's grace that we are saved. It is only when the Holy Spirit takes up residence, as we've seen, in our hearts that you're truly saved. Faith is a requirement for all believers, and it requires effort. Hebrews 11.6, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Notice, sincerely seek him. Reminds me of Jeremiah 29, 13. You will, God said you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. You can't seek God just on Sunday mornings or Wednesday evenings or Thursday evenings. No, you have to seek him with your whole heart. We can't hold anything back. As we've seen, the prayer, this is more than just saying mere words or just reading your Bible. Remember, hungering and thirst. 
You don't hunger and thirst after a menu. But what's be, that you get from getting the menu? And yes, we all experience times where we wane, where we stumble, where we fall into hard practices or, or bad habits. And if we're on our own, it can be very easy to get lost. But as we'll see, we're not. Paul, in previous chapters of Romans, repeatedly warned the Gentiles not to become arrogant. Arrogant, which refers to excessive or overbearing pride. He warned that just as the Jews who believed that because of their bloodline, God had to save them, were absolutely wrong. And as we saw, Paul showed that there were already examples of this in the Bible, people who were, could follow Abraham's bloodline, but they weren't saved. And God, likewise, most certainly would not spare people who simply believed, I'm saved because I said a prayer, or because so-and-so said I was saved, or because I was baptized, or I attended church, or I did the things that Christians do, as their proof that the uh, claim of being Christians. It's very easy to become proud and arrogant when you believe your salvation is about something you've done. And as we saw in the introduction, our salvation has nothing to do with what we do. We were bought with a price. We have to remember our place, what God has done to bring us salvation. Our salvation has everything to do with God's grace. Because of this, as we saw last week, it's only reasonable for us to be willing to give all our all to God. Pride is a sin that, like lying, is associated with Satan. And pride is an insidio insidious sin that some people don't even realize they have. I once heard a man pray 20 minutes at a men's breakfast, thanking God how humble he was. Oh, he was so humble. And when he got done, he really thought, he was doing good. But that wasn't a prayer of humility. It was a prayer of pride. Because everything he brought up was all about how he was doing so much better. And, and he was doing this. And, oh, thank God, I'm, I'm so much more humble. Pride can slip into our lives in many ways. And as Christians, we have to be diligent and on our guard. Which is why Paul says you have to do a careful examination. We can see pride enter people's lives when their lives are, uh, salvation is based on anything that they said and done. Anything. Oh, that pastor really touched me and, and, and I'm going to just follow him forever. No. It can also happen when people start to see God's works through others. They will start to praise the person instead of the God behind the person. How many Christian ministers have fallen prey to the flattery of man? How many Christians live for the praise of worldly men or women? You see, it's easy to look at the size of a church or the money the church possesses and in so doing take our eyes off the God who's doing it all. Sometimes pride can keep in when we make our faith walk all about ourselves. We study God's word, but we only do it on our own. That way no one argues with us. We don't have to defend what we believe. We pray, but mostly to ourselves. And while that's okay, the Christian walk is not made up of lone wolves. And that's how Paul moves on now. Christians must realize they are part of something bigger than just themselves. When back in the, the Middle Ages, the, the people put themselves away in, into monasteries or nunneries and said, well, look at what we're doing. We're going to just focus on God. It was a direct violation of what the Great Commission said. But then they don't have to argue with people. It doesn't matter. We are called to be out in the world, not in ourselves. You have to be a part of the local church. The idea that you can detach yourself from church and pursue God on your own is a recipe for destruction. Why? Because it's easy to get turned around as you study God's word and apply your own personal beliefs to that studying. Now, I'm not saying personal Bible studies and devotions are bad. No, I think everyone should do them. And solidarity prayers are good in themselves. But they should not be done alone. 
you need time of Bible studies with others where people can, you can learn with and from each other. And errant beliefs can be brought to the surface and identified as such. Otherwise, errant beliefs can color another person's beliefs. And it might be just a little turn at the beginning of their study life, but by the time they're 10 years down the road, it's a major thing. I've seen people who've come to Bible studies get corrected because they said something that was clearly wrong and doesn't line up with Scripture. They never come back to the Bible study. And when you try to talk to them, just, I don't agree with that. I'm sorry. No. That's what you were supposed to do. And if, if something you believe does not line up in Scripture, then you've got to get rid of what you believe because Scripture is the source of truth, not ourselves. And I've seen this. I, I've seen a person once said to me, and actually we argued quite uh, passionately about it, that compared a president of the time to Emperor Nero and said Nero was a nicer guy than that current president. And they told me I would never honor that man. I was like, but that's what the Bible says. And even when they were confronted with Scripture, they refused to relent because that's what they wanted to believe. I truly believe that person dug their heels in so deep because they were more defined by what politics they followed than who they said they belonged to. And had they come to more group studies and studied the word of God with others, other people would be just correcting them. They would see examples in the Bible how that wrong that is. It reminds me of this survival skill. You know, if you get lost in the woods and you're by yourself, it's a terrible thing. But one of the most terrible things is, you know, we're all born with one of two birth defects. Either you have one leg longer than the other or the one that's shorter than the other. Which leads to the fact that most people, when in the woods, you will walk in circles. It might be a two or three mile circle, but you will walk in a, almost a perfect circle because your one leg is longer or the other leg might be shorter. And so it's always better to hike as a group. Because as a group, you walk in a line, and the guy in the rear looks and says, that's the goal where we're heading, and then he can direct the person in the front that the line goes in that direction. Or when you see a, la a lake appear in the desert, if you have someone else with you, they kind of go, yeah, that's a mirage. Forget it. And so when we study God's word as a group, it's easier to correct errant directions before we get too far afield, which dovetails nicely into what now Paul's speaking about, that they're all part of the body of Christ, as Paul continues in Romans 12, 4 and 5. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Now, in both Corinthians and Ephesians, Paul uses the same analogy uh, to use the number of, uh, that we're part of the body. And he compared the Christian church to a body. And not all members in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 31, we won't go there, but not all members of the body have the same function. And what kind of a crazy body would it be? He says, if we all did, if the whole body was an eye, how would you hear? I guess you could move because you just roll around. But, you know, but you're part of the body. And no amount of complaining will change that. But I don't want to do this, God. It doesn't matter. He's God. We're not. Does that mean that if we don't like something about when we're in a, a local church that we, we shouldn't pray about it? No, we should pray about it. But remember, prayer more often than not changes our hearts, not God's. And so, the functions each part performs is done for the good of the body. And the body has local representations that we call the local church. 
and every Christian should be a part of a local church. Please understand, every part of your body contributes to the functioning of the body as a whole. And as a church, being made up of individuals, we support the church as a whole. Pastor, you're repeating yourself. I know, it's important. Not only do we support the church as a whole, but we depend on other members of the church to work together, for the, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of the whole. Let me be blunt. Any Christian who is not a functioning, serving member of a local church is living outside the will of God. If a part of your body starts to function for its own benefit, it is no longer serves for the betterment of the body. We have a name for it. It's called cancer. And yes, you know, cancer can grow incredibly fast. It can grow huge. But because it's not for the betterment of the body, it kills the body. So we who are many are still part of the body of Christ. We are not part of it for ourselves or for our benefit, but for the benefit of one another. We also share pain that's felt by the church. In 1 Corinthians 12, 26, if one part suffers, all parts suffer with it, and if one part is honored, all parts are glad. When we hear of suffering in another church, Maybe a church is going through a horrible time. We should drop and be in prayer, not as if it's happening to us. When we hear of pastors in Canada going to prison because they preach on certain passages of the Bible against certain lifestyles, it should affect us and drop us to our knees as if it was happening right here. As if we're part of that church because we are. Tony Evans puts it this way, because you're a part of the body, you matter. But because you're only one part, it's not all about you. I like that. And Paul Brand writes, we are all called to bear the image as a body. Because any one of us taken individually will present an incomplete image. One partially false and always distorted, like a single glass chip hacked from a mirror. But collectively, in our diversity, we can come together as a community of believers to restore the image of God in this world. I thought that was a very good thing. And, and today you can have, buy software that will look at all your pictures and you can say, I want this picture to look from a distance like this person. And it will combine, like organize the picture. It's called, uh, oh, I just had it, photosomy or... There's a term for it. You know, if you look at it, it's like a picture from a distance. You know, oh, that's a picture of, uh, of Jesus. And then you can look closer. It's a bunch of individual pictures, very small, put together. And it makes it look like, after, after the service, I'll look it up and let you know if you're interested. But there's software that will actually do that. It will look at all your pictures, and you can look at say, okay, I want to do this. And it will arrange the pictures. We serve. That's key. We serve. We function in the body of Christ. And when you're a small church, this analogy is amplified. Often people have to wear many different hats in the ministry because we are few, even though we are many. It becomes keenly evident when people decide to stop functioning to support the body and focus on supporting themselves supporting their interests or their pleasure, or I just want to do it my way. Now Paul goes on to share how God has given people gifts in order to help support the church. Romans 12, verses 6 to 8. Notice, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, Speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, 
Take the responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Our gifts were given to us by God, by His grace. They're not meant to bring attention to ourselves. After all, a Christian, no matter how gifted, serves for the benefit of the body. Gifts are not meant to be held back. They are meant to be used. The gifts that Paul lists here are about proclaiming the word of God and expanding the work of God. And everyone here, if you are a true believer, has been given a gift. And every believer here is responsible before God to find out what that gift is, develop it through exercise, and use it for the work of God of the body. And some people are like, well, I, I've, I, when I was down at First Baptist, they'd pass out these tests, and they were just psych exams. No matter how, I, I could have answered the questions in a certain way and had all these gifts, and even if I answered it honestly, that gift is not, in the, that list is not in the Bible, that test is not in the Bible. You have to search out what your gift is. And you'll know it when you find it. Now, if, you're a gift, if you say, well, I don't have the gift of teaching, so I don't have to be a teacher. No, no. What he's saying is, that will make it easier. That will make things go easier. But if God's called you to teach, then you should re- you're going to have to work harder. You're going to have to study harder. Uh, when Joanne was with us, she was not a gifted teacher. But she would be calling Tracy up during the week. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to do this. I, I want to do it this way. And, and Tracy would mentor her on how to teach. And she poured effort into it. I know other people, Sunday school teachers, would come in on Fridays and Saturdays and run through the whole class so they would get it right, so they wouldn't fail before the kids. So we need to recognize all the gifts are essential and special but they all serve God's will. We should know whose we are and use the gifts to the service of our Lord and not for our personal benefit. If God's giving you the, uh, the gift of music, it shouldn't be about you. I forget what early Christian contemporary musician had it, but he basically gave his albums away. You know, because he felt this was a gift of God and, and he shared them for free. God's gifts do differ. But when Paul spoke of a measure of faith, he meant that God will give the spiritual power which is necessary and appropriate to carry out one's responsibility to the body. You cannot do it on your own. Our power may look like faith, but if we try to do it on our own, it will fail. Every Christian should know what your spiritual gift is. And you have to seek it out. You have to test it. Let me try this. And it's not wrong for a Christian to recognize their spiritual gifts or the gifts of others. What is wrong is the desire to give false recognition to yourself or overrate yourself. You see this a lot when people say, well, I want to lead a ministry. But their idea of leading is just telling other people what to do. Or, you know, grumbling and complaining behind the fact. And this is what harms a church when people overrate themselves, when they don't do an honest evaluation of themselves and try to perform ministries that they should not be in because they want to do. Christians should not be proud. As I was thinking of an example from the Bible, I think of, of that Phoenician, Syrian Phoenician woman. Remember her? She, her daughter was dying uh, in Mark 7, 25 and 26, it says, Right away, a woman who had heard that Jesus came fell at his feet. Her little girl was possessed by an evil spirit, and she begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. Now, we have to remember, the Syrian Phoenicians were a proud people. And here she is, begging Jesus. We should never be too proud to call out to God. We should never have such an elevated view of ourselves that falling on our knees and begging seems beneath us. Our spiritual issues 
Are our spiritual issues any less in need of Jesus than this woman's concern for her daughter? What would you not do to place yourself before the Lord and his grace? This woman would not let anything separate her from Jesus, his power to deliver her girl. She was willing to beg. Incredibly, we don't have to. When we're a Christian, we can just talk to Jesus immediately, but we should have that that attitude of begging before God, crying out to him. We're going to be voting on a new member in several weeks, as you heard. And one of the tendencies I beg you to avoid is piling a bunch of responsibility and work on a new person because they're young, they're new. That's not the way we should operate. Remember, we all serve in this body. And it's not just a pile of work on others. And besides, the Constitution says for six months they can't serve in leadership. Whoever put that in the, in the Constitution was, was mindful of what the Word says. We have to remember the big picture. God did it all. He can use us all. And if He wants to use us literally to the last drop, Praise God, he's chosen you to serve that way. He's given each one here his gifts to use. And we should use those gifts for the best of abilities, holding nothing back. You see, the opposite of pride is humility. And believers need to be humble. There should be no smirks on our face. Well, I know this, and you obviously don't. Because it's not about us. We support the body. We are not made to be served. We are made to serve in the body. Today, many Christians focus more on worldly weapons, political parties, number of people, amounts of money, arguments, and slander. But let me ask you, when in the Bible do you see Christians speak out against those in authority over them? I guarantee you, you never see it. Christians didn't argue, even when they were being taken and killed. In horrible ways, in ways that we can't even imagine. They didn't speak out. Also in the Bible, when do you see a person say, just say a prayer and you'll be saved and get on with your life? Oh, when people were saved in the Bible, it's the start of amazing things happening in their lives. And that is still available to believers today. If we are truly willing to be living sacrifices for our Lord, not just on Sunday, but every day, we should, like Paul, as he said to Timothy, he desired, or the Philippians, he desired to finish well, to be poured out like a drink offering, and not cling so tightly to this life that we're no heavenly good for anything. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the the gift, the greatest gift you've ever given, your Son, that provides salvation for us. (coughs) Lord, we thank you for the other gifts that you give us, the gift of this congregation, Lord. The gift each of us has been given. Lord, open our eyes to what we have and be willing to share it with others not to put attention to ourselves, but to glorify you and to to support each other in this church and this building. Father, open our eyes to our true eternal state, Lord. Convict us. Work in us. Lord, I ask you to grow us. We ask this all in your name. Amen.